Session 4 of the System View on Life, How Life Shaped the Biosphere. This will be a session on deep time, with a history of the biosphere from the very beginning to now and even the future, and it has many connections to the previous sections. I start with the origins of the Earth and of life, and I end with, with wisdom. And to remind you, uh, the general approach that I have in this lecture series is an active cognition. And within an active cognition, all cognition arises through and from interaction with the world. So that is kind of uh, the focus, how agents learn from interacting with the world and shape the world by interacting. To set the context uh, and give you a little bit of an overview, uh, let's start with the very, very basics. Um, life on Earth is in between short-range physics and long-range physics. The short-range physics is quantum mechanics and it says how atoms are formed and how molecules are formed. The long-range physics is about gravity and gravity keeps the planet together and keeps the solar system together and it's the driving force of the whole uh, universe. So that is long-term physics. Our Sun is somewhere in between. It is uh, long-range physics uh, because uh, it is kept together by gravity and it is short-range physics because its energy source is nuclear power. And all the energy that the Sun provides drives all life on Earth. But now the special thing is that without life, uh, not much would actually happen on Earth. And the, the region between molecules and, and the Earth as a whole would be hardly filled. So it would be kind of a bland uh, result. But what, what, uh, so, but what happened uh, is that life changed uh, pretty much every aspect of the surface of the Earth. And one of the things that it changed is the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, so it changed from lots of CO2 to uh, quite a little bit of CO2 and no oxygen whatsoever uh, to a lot of oxygen here. So that is created by life. And life also, of course, filled uh, the void here uh, with all kinds of different forms of life, plants, animals, etc. So this session is about the transition between this and that. So let's go um, uh, to some information about the Earth. The Earth is, mm, its center, it's mainly uh, nickel and, and especially iron uh, that is here. In the middle it is solid, here it is fluid. This is the place where the uh, magnetosphere originates from, that protects us from all kinds of radiation from outer space. This here is the mantle, which is uh, lighter than uh, the iron core, and therefore it floats on the iron core. It is molten and it, uh, it is very thick fluid, and it moves about. So uh, it moves a little bit like this and moves like that, and it means that there is a uh, movement pushing the, uh, the, the, the crust up down here, and in other places it moves the crust down. But the main point here is that uh, the Earth, the place where all life uh, is occurring, is in a very thin layer. Uh, compared to the uh, size of the Earth, it's only 0.3%. It's 20 kilometers thick, uh, a few kilometers below the surface until uh, a few kilometers above the surface. That is the place where life and the biosphere exists. So where is life um, made from and the main elements are here uh, and these are the rock forming elements uh, which is mainly oxygen and silicium and uh, here we have some uh, iron with a fair amount of iron uh, but mainly at the core and uh, these are the minor elements and most of them are light so these are the heavy elements uh, like gold here for example here um, we have the lighter elements and life is predominantly made from the lighter elements. And why? Because the lighter elements float on the heavier elements and the heavier elements are at the center of the, the earth. So the lighter elements, they uh, were able to, to move to the outer sphere of the earth. So we have uh, hydrogen, we have oxygen here, we have carbon, and those are 
what the biomass, most part of the biomass is here. There's a little bit of nitrogen, it's, much of it is in the atmosphere, also in our bodies, in proteins. And uh, we have uh, enzymes uh, with, with phosphorus, sulfur and, uh, and chloride. Um, here we have some salts, uh, sodium, potassium, calcium. Those form the salts in the sea and also the salts in our cells. And, and then we have a little bit of iron, for example, in our cells, in blood cells, uh, but, but most of these uh, materials we, we hardly use. The abundant stuff at the surface of the earth is where we are made of. Well, the next overview thing is, is the whole history of our earth until now. So the earth is about 4.6 billion years old and it uh, started with a fairly short period of about 1 billion or half a billion, something like that, uh, years. This is called the Hydean and there was no life whatsoever. Uh, then we had an area, a long area, where there were sea bacteria, something from here or something like that. Um, and then the sea bacteria became more advanced, uh, so a, a bigger, uh, and it had a very, very strong effect that, that happened about here, 2.4 billion years ago. Um, here we got, about 1 billion years ago, we got multicellular life, where we are an example of. Uh, just like we are uh, eukaryotes, by the way. Um, and and uh, vertebrates, uh, animals uh, like, like us, they existed only uh, in this period, and humans, well, they are really very, very thin sliver. So one might ask the questions, uh, where are the roots of behavior and psychology in this? Uh, because we are talking about uh, an active cognition. Uh, so. Well, I think that this is a pre pretty good place, the start of life. And because the start of life was the difference between matter without agency and matter with agency. And agency has been a kind of an important uh, concept until now. So here agency started. Well, let's uh, go to the history that I want to tell in a fairly simple graph. Um, so this is time, linear time. This is the early Earth 4.6 billion years ago. This is now. Uh, and what happened is we had three uh, domains of life. We had uh, the first, the prokaryotes, bacteria, archaea. And then we had eukaryotes, it's cells like our cells, plants and animal cells. And then we had multicellular uh, organisms like, like us. And uh, during this whole period, there were a number of uh, big trends. One is that the temperature gradually decreased. Yes. So this is this is now current levels, by the way. Uh, and what also happened is that CO2 was gradually captured, captured more and more in biomass and uh, in sediments. So we we are losing CO2, and, and we still have a fair amount left, but not as much as there was in the beginning. Um, at the same time. Uh, we gained from almost nothing, or uh, we gained stepwise uh, oxygen in the atmosphere, and until the level somewhere here that animal life became possible. So before this, there was no animal life, and the reason for that was there was no oxygen for them uh, to breathe. So let's go to a more complicated graph, um, and this graph summarizes. Uh, the, the same as in the previous picture. The previous picture was mainly only the atmosphere. And uh, so this part here shows the atmosphere, this in the middle shows some activities in the land, and this uh, shows the ocean. And lots of things uh, were happening in this time. So by, by the way, this is uh, now log time. Yeah, so this is, a, this is one billion years, uh, this is a billion years, this is a billion years, and this is a bi almost a billion years. This is 65 million years ago, uh, uh, which was the time that the dinosaurs died out. So we are, we are not yet home, but we are, uh, in geological time scales, we are pretty, uh, pretty close. So uh, what I'm going to do is to move through uh, this picture and we go through oxidizing the air, problems with woods, uh, and, and eventually, uh, like I said, we end with the dinosaurs. 
So in order to understand this picture, uh, we first need to know something about the atmosphere and where the atmosphere actually originated from. The atmosphere and the, the hydrosphere, which is the oceans and, and all the water on, on Earth. Well, most of the atmosphere originated from the internal part of the Earth, where it simply, because it is light, it bubbled up and it bubbled up in magma. And uh, in the beginning of the Earth, there were lots of volcanoes. Uh, the, the, the beginning was basically one big volcano. Yeah, so uh, lots of uh, lighter stuff, water, nitrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, uh, that, that uh, appeared from inside uh, the Earth. And then we had some of the water that was split into hydrogen and in oxygen. Uh, but in the beginning, the oxygen uh, was almost directly taken away. So it, it hardly played a role in the beginning. The uh, hydrogen here is escaping. And why is the hydrogen escaping? Because it's a very, very light element and it is too light for the gravity of Earth to capture. This is a picture of that, so this is the surface temperature, this is uh, the escape velocity and these lines, they indicate the lines where a certain planet can still capture uh, hydrogen. So for example, these planets uh, uh, can capture hydrogen because this hydrogen line is below them. But the Earth can't capture hydrogen and not helium. But uh, for example, Venus can't capture water uh, and, and Mars also not. So that's the reason why Venus has very little water and the Earth has a lot of water. It, it simply it can't escape from the Earth's uh, gravity. But st Venus has a lot of CO2 uh, because it, 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 uh, it is heavier and Venus can easily capture it. So that is one of the reasons why the Earth has the particular composition that it has. And it is in a big part just luck because it has the proper size and the proper temperature. In this graph, I'm going to, uh, to show you the, the atmospheric changes. And this is the pre-life uh, atmosphere. So the pre-life atmosphere had a lot of uh, nitrogen, it has a f had a fair amount of methane, and it had uh, a lot of carbon uh, dioxide, and uh, it had uh, water. Um, and these two were the main important greenhouse gases that uh, kept the Earth nice and balmy. Actually, um, quite a bit warmer than it is now. Um, the current atmosphere looks quite different. Uh, we have more uh, nitrogen. And it is mainly nitrogen that escaped during the, uh, the, the billions of years from volcanoes. Um, instead of no oxygen, we have a fair amount of oxygen. Uh, we lost the methane, we lost almost all of the CO2, and we lost a little bit of water in the atmosphere. And this is mainly the effect of that it was warmer here and warm air can contain more water than, than uh, colder air. So that's the reason why there is less uh, water. Uh, but currently water is the main green greenhouse gas uh, because CO2 is no longer uh, uh, well, the main contribution of the atmosphere. So this was the original store of carbon for all of life. And uh, we got more oxygen because of photosynthesis, because of plants uh, using uh, CO2 and so this became uh, less and then producing oxygen into the atmosphere. And uh, the oxygen uh, in the atmosphere then also reacted to the methane in the atmosphere. So that's the reason why we have very little methane in the atmosphere. So th this, this change uh, that you see here is mainly the result of life and especially photosynthesis. Um, Another ingredient uh, that is uh, important is where the greenhouse effect originated from. Well, the greenhouse effect comes uh, from uh, the, the difference between uh, the sunlight uh, that the Earth uh, receives and the radiation that it sends out. So what is happening, the sun is very hot and it produces uh, different frequencies, especially ultraviolet light uh, uh, and, and visible light and, and some uh, infrared uh, radiation, and that is, that is this here. And, and it does so because it's 6,000 
degrees hot. That is the, the color associated with 6000 degrees here. The Earth is heated by the Sun, uh, but it is not as hot as the Sun. Uh, so the Earth is about 20 degrees and that has, uh, uh, it produces uh, radiation with a different envelope, so hardly overlapping actually. And so it receives uh, energy with these frequencies and then it sends out uh, energy with these frequencies. So this is in the uh, far infrared. And a part of what the Earth uh, sends out is captured by the atmosphere and part of what the Sun sends to the Earth is also captured by the atmosphere. And that is uh, depicted here. So for example, there is something that is called Rayleigh scattering and Rayleigh scattering is that uh, light particles are being scattered by atoms in the, in, in, in the air. And that is uh, in, in the area with, of light and it's more pronounced with blue light than with red light. And that is the reason why the, uh, the sky is blue. Because the sun sends out every color but the blue is scattered more so every part of the sky looks blue. Another thing is that this is uh, the contribution of oxygen and ozone and that is here and sometimes you hear about an, uh, the hole in the ozone layer. Well that is when there is less ozone and it reduces this part and it means that there is more ultraviolet uh, light and ultraviolet light is uh, harmful for, for life on earth. And why is it harmful? Because life hardly ever uh, protected itself against it because we had oxygen and ozone in the atmosphere. So that is, uh, we were standardly uh, protected anyway. So there was no reason to protect ourselves. Um, this is what the earth sends out. And, uh, and most of what it sends out is actually captured in some way in the atmosphere. And uh, so it's captured mainly by weight of uh, water vapor, uh, by carbon dioxide here and here, uh, but uh, that, is, that is a rather minor contribution. And it's also captured by uh, methane, for example. And currently we have very little methane, but if, you, if we increase methane, and because all kinds of forests are uh, sending out methane or something like that, and then this thing will, will, will rise and will have pretty quickly a more strong effect. So, this is associated with the total energy balance of the Earth. So this is all the energy that is coming in from the Sun and this is all that the Earth sends out. And it's a fairly complicated picture but uh, the key is that we receive uh, uh, st standard something like 341 uh, watts per square meter from uh, the Sun. Uh, and that is also more or less what we send out. And then the atmosphere, uh, it receives something and uh, it sends something out, it's almost the same. And the surface is actually the same. So it receives stuff and it sends uh, stuff out. But it receives stuff at a higher frequency, yeah, so light, uh, and, and it sends out at uh, thermal uh, frequencies. But the net uh, value, net, uh, the Earth uh, receives about uh, 0.9 watts per square meter, which is 0.26 percent. That the Earth is heating up with a little bit because uh, we send out less than we receive. That is this uh, particular point. And at some other points in time, it would be a negative number, and then the Earth would cool. Yeah, so in the uh, when we go into the direction of uh, an ice age, it would be cooling. All right. Next little topic is how life formed and especially where cells come from. And I base myself now on uh, the work of Eric Smith. Um, and we started at some point with a completely lifeless environment. But for whatever reasons, uh, we at some point there might be uh, a situation at some parts at the earth uh, where biochemical ingredients were available. And, and, and somehow it was accrued uh, there and it remained there. It was as a store for eventual life. And then maybe those biochemical ingredients learned to maintain uh, their activities. Uh, for, and, and so that we had biological, pre-biological uh, biochemical processes that were 
maintained. And because they were maintained, they could persist for a very long time. And therefore, they could be also fairly abundant because they kept on being there. Uh, the next step then would be that environment was partly self-maintaining and learned how to maintain itself. And because it learned how to maintain itself, it became uh, it could become even more abundant. Uh, well, the next step is that uh, life uh, organized itself in cells that were environments that were under their own control. They were able to do the self-maintenance much better, but at the same time they were still depending on their habitat uh, that was uh, more or less self-maintaining and that should uh, remain self-maintaining. So the idea here is that we had an ecology of biochemical processes uh, that, uh, that was already present here and here uh, and it remained here as well and if you looked from it from a big different distance uh, then, and, and you couldn't see all the cells then you would say well yeah maybe this uh, and this is actually the same. Uh, this is more efficient, uh, maybe you can measure that, uh, and why is it more efficient? Because it's organized in cells, but at a sh long distance you would just say, hey, weird, hey? We, we have three different forms of uh, self-maintaining biological, uh, biochemical processes. So let's think about how cells then uh, organize, and it has to do with a particular type of molecule, say soap uh, molecules. So when you have a soap molecule it has a water-loving lo side on one side and a non-water-loving and water-hating side on the other side. And uh, so a soap bubble is water uh, in between uh, soap molecules and the soap molecules here are in air. And this, these uh, molecules they they connect together kind of and form a very thin layer uh, of the soap bubble. And we all know that soap bubbles form fairly easily. Well, something very similar you can have if you have oil and water and a little bit of soap and you uh, shake it a bit and then you get different types of, uh, of, of, of bubbles. One type is uh, with a mono layer in which you have say water on the outside and oil, uh, which, which uh, is the, also in the water, which likes the water hating side of the soap on the inside. And we can also have a situation where we have just soap here uh, and water on the outside and water on the inside. And then the, the, the water hating part is, is, is uh, connecting internally. And so this is also a stable situation. And this is a physical process, it has nothing to do with uh, biology and it happens just where where water is moving and soap like substances are available. Um, why is that important? Well this is our picture uh, of agency and agency is the ability to adaptively regulate your in and output and basically form a boundary layer between the agent and the rest of the world that is under your control. So this is the boundary layer then uh, of the agent, but it's only an agent when it has brought uh, the input and output under its own control. So this is not yet an agent, but it's, well, it's coming kind of close. So what makes this an agent? Well, this is a picture of a cell uh, and this is the boundary layer. This is the inside of the cell, this is the outside of the cell, this is your soapy layer or so. And here in this cell are all kinds of molecules that uh, execute the process of uh, adaptively regulating its coupling with its environment. And hence, uh, the agency is actually in the cell membranes. Uh, so this, for example, is a membrane uh, that, that can lead, that can allow certain stuff uh, flowing in. Uh, and uh, this might be a sensor of some sort. Uh, so if it feels whether certain molecules here and here, it's actually the same. And so it, it is sensing and it is also acting on its environment via the membrane. And it's uh, much too complicated, but a, a really interesting thing. Uh, so the agency is in the membrane. This is the place where life more uh, on all other places uh, really happens. And, and this is, you see that at more places. So the difference then uh, between subagentic life, if you call it life, uh, and uh, agentic life, 
uh, is that we have uh, agents here that are able to control their own internal environment. Yeah, so this is subagentic. Uh, it, the habitat conditions allow a continued process and it's more the habitat that allowed, allows to con, uh, the, the process and uh, the biochemical process. Uh, here we have a situation with agents uh, that safeguard the continued existence of both self and the habitat. Yeah, so the moment they screw up the habitat, uh, they take more from it than the habitat can deliver, than its carrying, carrying capacity, and then they will die. So uh, agents from the very beginning should take care of their habitat. It's really important. And, and in both cases, we have an ecology of biochemical process. So we, from, from a distance, it look, just looks like a lot of chemistry is going on. So what, uh, what led this to? Mainly in three groups, bacteria, archaea and eukarya. We are the eukarya, animalia here, uh, and, but the most common life forms are bacteria and archaea. And the, the difference between bacteria and archaea is uh, that they are, they have different cell membranes, are some more uh, di uh, differences, but this is the same cell membrane as we have, but the archaea have a heavier cell membrane met with, with little uh, methyl groups, well it's not so important what it is, and, and this is also part is slightly different here. Um, and this allows them to live in more difficult environments very uh, salty environments with lots of methane, with uh, lots of acidity, with very hot uh, environments or whatever. This, this, these are uh, really the ones that can live pretty much everywhere. These are the, the bacteria. They have cells like us. They live in more or less the same environments as we do, uh, but they are much simpler. So, and it's the same for archaea, by the way. Yeah? They have a cell uh, body and uh, they within the cell body they somewhere have their uh, genetic material sitting and all the processes are basically executing uh, here. Uh, within eukarya uh, we have the same kind of uh, cell membrane structure but we have a much more complicated cell in which we do the stuff also a much bigger one. Uh, so that this is progress let's say. and uh, the eukarya have some of the processes of archaea and some of the properties of bacteria, so kind of, kind of an in-between type of thing, or based on both. Well, let's now go to the story of how life uh, developed uh, and, and how early life developed. So, uh, life probably or likely uh, started in hydrothermal uh, vents deep in the ocean. And those are places where uh, the earth crust is uh, very thin and where volcanoes happen over a very long uh, ridge and where all kinds of materials from the inside of the earth are being dispersed in the surrounding seawater. And it leads to all kinds of different gradients of sulfur, of iron, of uh, carbon dioxide, of methane, of whatever uh, is uh, also temperature, salinity, etc. And the, the, the different gradients entail that all kinds of micro environments are being created. And pretty much every uh, chemical process is possible somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of these vents. And that makes it a very uh, likely starting place. Uh, for life, but it's 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 very deep. It's uh, maybe three kilometers uh, below sea level. Energy source here is uh, mainly uh, that water from the vent is very alkaline, uh, so uh, the opposite of, of uh, acidity, and uh, while the seawater is uh, slightly acidic, acidic and. Um, and what happened here for the first time is that biomass was created and typically uh, by combining water with methane in some way or hydrogen with uh, carbon dioxide, uh, different types of, of, of processes, both are possible. But this is the kind of the shorthand of uh, biomass, which is a combination of carbon and water, hydrocarbons, uh, we call them. And uh, so this is, this is uh, biomass in all the pictures that I show. Um, and this, 
still it is life uh, so we have to, to, to think about all the requirements of life and I, I already hinted to it life uh, needs to take care of its own needs uh, in the service of contributing to the habitat because if the habitat is not maintained really well then it has no place to live you know, so it needs to protect its own viability via coping uh, and it uh, needs to contribute to the env to environmental quality co-creation and we have seen this one uh, before life is about avoiding death and co-creation uh, in a highly viable habitat and it's balancing asserting yourself which is energy intensive and doing stuff in the world versus uh, adapting to the situation which can be much more energy efficient. That leads uh, to now an agent uh, that has an idea of uh, what in what type of environment it is. Uh, so it can be in a rich environment where it has many different opportunities of high affordance content. It can be in a safe environment where it is easy to select your behavior uh, and, and where there are well, no dangers and, and uh, maybe ample food. This is the place uh, where you can learn, for example. Um, this is a precarious environment, which is a dangerous environment. Whatever you do, uh, it might be the wrong action. Uh, so uh, your, your action selection is a really difficult thing. And it can be an efficient environment, an environment that simply does not provide you but with uh, enough of what you need. So you're, uh, you're deficient. And that leads to something that you could call action readiness. Uh, so depending on the environment where you are, uh, in a rich environment you can learn, in a safe environment you can care for yourself and for the world. In a deficient environment you have to protect yourself and protect whatever you still have and in a precarious environment uh, you have maybe you have to fight or you have to make uh, difficult decisions in order not to die. Now so this is action readiness and this has to do with uh, also my, my field of science, uh, soundscape and the generalization so a soundscape is an acoustic environment as perceived uh, or experienced and or understood by personal purple, uh, people in context. And if you generalize that and then we are at the course, uh, the world as perceived or experienced and or understood by an agent or group of agents in context. So the world as perceived, well the world as perceived as precarious, as rich, as safe, as deficient, etc. So this is kind of logical that it is connected. Also, uh, we have uh, cognitivity. Uh, what was cognitivity? Uh, it a system is cognitive when its behavior helps uh, its continued existence and helps its flourishing. Yeah, so this is the thriving, coping and problem solving part and this is the thriving, co-creation and pervasive optimization uh, part. So let's think about a bit about a flourishing. Um, so when are you flourishing? Well, you are flourishing uh, the moment when you can protect, maintain and extend the conditions on which your existence uh, depends. And when you do that, uh, you uh, increase the basis for your existence uh, by uh, improving the conditions. Uh, and so this loop has to be going on all of the time. And apparently this is what the biosphere dis did. It started from something very uh, small and punny and, and it has the current huge uh, size. Uh, and uh, let's, let's uh, go into this one again, the measure of the genetic success. Uh, so if you are often in the co-creation mode, so hence you can cont uh, uh, contribute to a better world in which uh, long-term needs are satisfied and then you have high cognitivity. And apparently the biosphere was able to do that. It, it created a really wonderful environment for ever more forms of life. So in that respect uh, you can say that the biosphere had uh, high cognitivity. Uh, but not always, sometimes it was withering at some places at least. All right, let's um, we had life at the vents uh, and, and uh, there was water and uh, maybe around the vents water could, uh, life could exist uh, but the water was flowing and, uh, and then uh, the living cells would flow into the water and maybe uh, 
uh, hundreds or tens of years later, it would uh, return to one other vent, uh, and there it might have uh, part of its life. Uh, but it could also uh, move up into the water column to the surface, and there it had a, a pretty dangerous situation. It was the sun with ultraviolet violet, uh, light, uh, but also with great opportunities to, to use the sun as an energy source to create biomass. And that was what happened with cyanobacteria. They found a trick uh, to create, to combine CO2 in the air and also in the water, uh, with water uh, to create biomass. But the energy for that was from uh, the sun and it needed the sun. So it could only happen in the uppermost layers of the sea. So uh, first 10 meters or something like that. Um, but this already had a pretty direct effect. So this led to the liberation of oxygen. So part of uh, the oxygen of water uh, was, was released and it became oxygen. And oxygen then started to, uh, to react with the partially oxidized iron, iron 2, uh, in, in, in the seawater. And that led to rust and rust uh, doesn't uh, dissolve so well, so the end result is that it fell to the bottom. The oxygen started to react with the bacteria uh, and it changed it back to carbon dioxide and water. And this led to the first mass extinction. All the bacteria that couldn't protect itself uh, because they didn't have antioxidants yet, uh, they, they died basically. So this, this led to really big mass extinction. Something else that happened is that uh, the oxygen reacted to the methane in uh, the atmosphere and it took away a greenhouse gas and it added a little bit more carbon dioxide but that was only a little bit of greenhouse effect. So the net result was that it became cooler. And another effect was that uh, iron uh, reacted and that fell to the bottom. So uh, from the top to the bottom gradually more and more of the uh, iron 2 was reacted away in fully oxidized iron and rusted. And this uh, basically removed the iron from the sea and gradually from the top down. So that is, that is uh, indicated here. Well, then something on ice ages. Um, ice ages, they are caused by a, a large number of different effects that come together. Uh, one is that the sun might be uh, become a little bit less uh, effective. Uh, our place in the galaxy is also important. Uh, at some places we receive more um, galactic rays and more galactic rays uh, lead to more effects on the atmosphere and that leads to a cloud cover. Uh, so it increases the whiteness of the earth and the whiteness of the earth uh, leads to more reflection and the reflection leads to a colder temperature. Another thing is the so-called Milankovitch cycles. The Earth doesn't have a completely stable orbit. Sometimes it's more round, sometimes it's less round. So if you have a summer here, uh, where you're further from the Sun, which is, this is by the way quite uh, a little bit extreme, uh, but w when you have a summer here, uh, or when you have a summer here, uh, this is farther from the Sun, so it's less warm. Um, another thing is that uh, the tilt of the uh, axis of the Earth uh, is different and the, the, the pole might aim at a different place in space. And these all have effects on how much uh, warmth uh, the Earth uh, uh, receives. Another thing is the position and shape of the continents and especially when you have continents at the poles and you have a place where the uh, ice can set and, uh, and, and persist. Uh, and, and that is the ideal position for ice ages. And another thing is ocean circulation. If, if the oceans bring warm water to the poles, then uh, it will warm the poles and the, the chances for an ice age are less. Um, what happened uh, about two billion years ago is that we had the first complex cells, the first eukaryotes. And what was special about them is that they had more membranes. 
and eukaryotes were a symbiosis uh, between different cells. So for example, the chloroplasts uh, that are the things in plant cells, they do the, the photosynthesis, uh, they were other cells, other bacteria that uh, started to work together with, uh, with other bacteria and they ended up uh, forming kind of a colony within a cell and every one doing his own uh, job. So same with mitochondria. Uh, this is uh, this is a mitochondrium here, and the same mitochondrium is in uh, exists in animal cells. Um, the important thing is that uh, these complex cells they have a lot of internal membranes, and those internal membranes uh, they are associated with agency, yeah, because agency allows you uh, to to uh, create local environments under your control, and that is exactly what is happening here within all those membranes. And um, they also uh, have now more possibilities for cellular skeletons, uh, so they like, like the outside of this and uh, some other possibilities. So how did that work? Well, we had first a simple bacterium uh, and the bacterium then, uh, it might have engulfed its own bacterium outside membrane so that it became more or less an inside membrane and so this is an area that is much more under your control and you can do all kinds of little processes and, and therefore you gain control uh, and it eventually became something that is called the endoplasmatic reticulum uh, that is this stuff uh, which was uh, originally yeah, just inward folded uh, outer membrane. Um, and then uh, the, it, it swallowed different uh, bacteria, yeah, so here and here, uh, and uh, in the direction of plant cells, uh, we had so-called plastids, so that they're doing the, the photosynthesis, and this is in the direction of animal cells. So the key point is that these cells uh, became much more complex with much more internal membranes, and therefore uh, allowing for a much higher level of control and agency over the own situation. Well, the, uh, especially the eukaryotic plant cells, the algae, uh, they became really, really very efficient in photosynthesis. And they released uh, a, a relentless amount of oxygen. Although they released uh, an enormous amount of oxygen, the oxygen level in, in the world hardly changed. And why did it hardly change? Because there was so much to oxidize. Pretty much the whole earth was filled with every, all kinds of stuff that could be oxidized, from iron uh, to, to all kinds of metals. The sea, exactly the same. There was a lot of iron uh, dissolved in, in uh, the sea, and it had to be taken out step by step. Uh, and so gradually it was taken out more and more until uh, on, at the surface here it, everything that could be oxidized was oxidized and only at that point the uh, oxygen level could rise. So this took more than a billion years, something like 1.4 billion years. It, it, uh, where the, the, the oxygen level remained the same, the same but the surface of the earth and also the sea uh, they were gradually becoming less uh, metal-like and more oxidized and hence also uh, a less uh, reactive place where eventually life could walk and live. So from about uh, 900 million years ago, so less than a billion years ago, uh, the, the, the atmosphere started to fill itself uh, with oxygen and that was the result of all kinds of plants uh, in the sea, algae, kelp, those kind of things uh, uh, that first oxygenated uh, the oceans and via the, the oceans it went into the air. But uh, this also coincided with another snowball earth uh, moment. Uh, at that moment there were supercontinents at the poles um, there was an easy buildup of land ice and because there was so much uh, CO2, uh, carbon being used by all the animals and all the plants uh, and part in the exoskeletons, so in the, in, in, in the bones etc. Of, uh, of, of bacteria, well not really bones, um, 
uh, that led to a reduced uh, CO2 and therefore a reduced um, a greenhouse effect and a cooler earth. Uh, we also lost eventually all the uh, methane and for some reason uh, the albedo, the, the, the reflectivity of the earth uh, increased and it led to uh, about a hundred or two hundred uh, million year long period of snowball earth uh, where the earth was pretty much completely uh, covered in ice, maybe a few places, places around the equator not. And that eventually ended uh, because the volcanoes started or continued sending out CO2 in the atmosphere and that led to uh, a bigger greenhouse effect and eventually uh, apparently uh, the earth escaped from the snowball earth uh, phase. And below uh, the ice, uh, life had, had continued, maybe at a slower pace, but it also had, a, had developed a few innovations, probably in order to live in the more difficult environment. And, but that was a pretty important uh, step. So now we are kind of halfway, uh, halfway on a logarithmic axis. And this is um, the point where life as we know it started to begin and in a process called the Cambrium Explosion. That was uh, 530 million years ago on a Tuesday. And at that stage, bigger animals were possible uh, because there was uh, oxygen uh, produced by photosynthesis. So animals don't produce oxygen, they, they use it uh, to breathe. Uh, and, and therefore animals uh, could become bigger and, and, and more pervasive and also uh, venture a little bit on land. But what really happened in the Cambrian explosion was that body plants, new body plants were uh, developed and cells learned tricks on how to do, how to specialize within one, a single organism. Uh, so we got special cells uh, that learned to become a gut cell, a heart cell, a mouse cell, a brain cell or whatever. And uh, and there were all kinds of different body plans developed. So this is the body plan of the vertebrates and we are a vertebrate and this is our basic body plan, it's still the same. Um, and so this is, this is the, the, the proto-brain, this is the vertebrate uh, or the, the, the nerve uh, through uh, our, our body. Uh, this is the mouth, the, we have something of eyes or uh, the heart here. Um, but important this here is uh, another environment that we created. This is our gut and it's say the outside uh, turned inside. Uh, and here we have all kinds of bacteria living in this uh, and it's still the same. It used to uh, at that, this moment also. And those bacteria, they work with us in a symbiotic way and uh, they do part of the, or of the digestion of our food. And so we, we are actually, we are a, a big colony. But this also gave us more agency uh, because this new membrane. Well, at the Cambrium explosion, all the different body plants uh, developed. So uh, we are the chordates, uh, so we are, we are here, but all kinds of other different body plants uh, developed. And, and from here on, we had all kinds of different uh, animal lines uh, developing. Uh, and, and plants are uh, not in here, but they are part of, of this, uh, this branch. The Cambrian explosion was, uh, was an animal thing. Then um, a plant thing is, was that plants started to become more and more prevalent uh, everywhere uh, around the earth. And um, so they settled on everywhere they could settle and they started to do the photosynthesis. Uh, so this is the photosynthesis formula with a depletion of uh, carbon dioxide. And that was especially bad because wood was not degraded. There was nothing that could eat uh, the lignin of wood. And that was the origin of our coal deposits. And so all the coal deposits are trees, falling on trees, falling on trees, falling on trees, and never being degraded. But because they were not degraded, it led to uh, a reduction of uh, carbon dioxide levels. Uh, levels below, probably, 
our current levels. Our current levels are 400 parts per million, and, and pre-industrial it was 280 parts per million. Uh, so this might have uh, went to, to a level close to what it was now. Uh, but it used to be much higher than it was now. Uh, at the same time, it became colder because uh, less greenhouse effect and drier. Uh, and plants were, although they were everywhere, they were actually starving because plants at that time need at least 150 parts per million in order to grow CO2. Um, and that uh, became more and more difficult and they were not used to it. They were uh, developed all the, 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 the machinery for photosynthesis was developed for maybe a thousand parts per million or, or two thousand parts per million. And so plants were actually, although super abundant, not doing that well. Uh, and uh, that eventually uh, became a carbon crisis. And what happened uh, in a certain situation, uh, the, the Oxygen levels were really high, we had big insects uh, and those insects lived in forests and those forests they were a little bit dwindling, um, so there was no wood uh, being degraded, so there would have been massive, massive fires. And, uh, but at the same time plants would have difficulty in, in uh, growing uh, because the CO2 level uh, was, was, uh, was pretty low. And then uh, white rot, a fungus, uh, so the familiar fungus like this uh, came to the rescue because it was the first life form that was able to break down the lignin in wood. And that led to uh, a, a super time for uh, the white rot fungus and a rapid release of all the, of CO2. So all layers on layers of wood could now be eaten and that meant uh, that the uh, CO2 levels started rising again and quite a bit uh, and uh, the temperature uh, with it because of more greenhouse effect also rose again. So that was a good thing. However, uh, it also led to the biggest extinction ever. So what was happening? Well, the trees, uh, they were growing now really happily and uh, they were learning how to crush uh, rock uh, with their roots. And so they made the soil in part. And uh, the soil had a much uh, bigger surface area. And with the surface area uh, of the soil, all kinds of materials became available. And with uh, the rotting material of the trees, it uh, went to the sea. And in the sea, it brought a lot of stuff that uh, cyanobacteria and algae uh, algae uh, really love. And they started to bloom. And that entailed that there were lots of, uh, of, of regions, of the whole ocean actually, uh, was almost completely green because of the algae that had a super time. But they took away uh, the, the oxygen from the sea, so it made it very difficult for uh, all kinds of life forms to live. They poisoned the sea with uh, cyanide and it led to huge, huge dead zones. And that caused the biggest extinction uh, of all until now, with 97% of all marine species uh, being well, dying. And why did they die? Because uh, there was so much going on on land uh, and, and there was so much uh, nutrients uh, made available on land, they were useful on land, but uh, at the sea uh, they were uh, leading to a situation with uh, only cyanobacteria and algae and, and uh, hardly anything else that could uh, survive. So this was a big extinction where eventually also 70% of all uh, at that moment existing vertebrate species uh, went, went out of existence. We still have uh, this uh, effect uh, and, and we have still have dead zones in the sea they are fairly small but uh, well everywhere where there is a lot of industrial agriculture and a lot of uh, industrial processing of lands uh, there we, we have dead zones in the sea and this is a little bit older picture but it's still uh, very very prevalent so now we are getting close to to now, uh, we, we are in this area here, 
and in this area uh, we are going gradually to the current state uh, so carbon dioxide is still going down oxygen is slowly going up uh, when carbon dioxide is going down oxygen is typically going up uh, because there is a little bit less or less carbon dioxide the temperature is going down and yeah, because of, of, uh, of its greenhouse effect uh, reducing um, and the whole situation now is that it uh, the last hundred billion years or so is gradually getting cooler and especially since uh, the end of the dinosaur so uh, at this point 50 uh, 65 uh, bill million years ago uh, the temperature has been uh, declining uh, quite a lot so this is our current temperature this is this level and with all kinds of proxies we have found uh, that, that uh, the temperature uh, something like 50 a million years ago was 10 degrees higher and but uh, during our ice ages it was it could have been eight degrees lower than, than uh, it is currently anyway um, there's something interesting going on somewhere somewhere here and that is that plants found a new way of doing uh, photosynthesis and now we have another type of plant the so-called c4 plant that has a much higher photosynthesis efficiency they are not as prevalent but the more the carbon dioxide level decreases, uh, the more uh, the C4 plants will, will uh, have a chance. Also, what was special is that because of the temperature going down, we all of a sudden got more and more ice ages. Yeah, so, and during an ice age, uh, we have more life in the sea, and between, between ice ages, we typically have more life on land. And um, that is the pattern where we are. And now so uh, going back to our terraforming summary so we started with an atmosphere with uh, lots of uh, co2 and um, we ended up with an atmosphere with very little co2 um, this is the, the storage for all of life so all the carbon uh, for, for life is now actually in life in biomass in living life, uh, or in skeletons of of, uh, of of former animals and plants or in in, in, in coal and, and things like that um, oxygen has gone up and has changed the world has oxidized the world and now we have a, a world that is full of photosynthesis and and it keeps its uh, oxygen level high and actually makes it higher and higher gradually um, but uh, because we lost some greenhouse gases the temperature uh, has gone down and, uh, and therefore is a little bit less water in the atmosphere and so there's also less rain now than it used to be uh, but the main thing is that life uh, created the conditions uh, for life itself and life really makes a difference uh, so this is a picture of Mars and this is kind of the same place uh, somewhere on earth and this is 100% uh, uh, or almost 100% the difference uh, between a living planet and a non-living planet. And something about the future of the biosphere. Um, what can we say about the future? Well, the next 600 million years are not too bad. Uh, and 600 million years ago there was not even uh, a complex animal. Yeah? So we are about halfway. And so it will be nice for, for quite a while. Um, this picture is a, is a simulation and, uh, of, of what type of life can exist uh, on Earth based on uh, the carbon dioxide, uh, because uh, life needs carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. And it's, uh, this is the region uh, where uh, bacteria can live, this is where eukaryotes can live, and this is where complex life can live. And, live. and complex life could only exist uh, from 500 billion years ago. And we are now here, and uh, somewhere around 1 billion years in the future, uh, there will simply be not enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, to sustain plants and to sustain uh, animal life. So complex life will end in about uh, one uh, billion years. So some conclusions on this part. Well, 
we, uh, that is all complex multicellular life, uh, we are living in a one billion window of opportunity. And until now we have taken that opportunity really, really well. Um, we are now in the middle of our opportunity. So our lives, uh, our complex multicellular lives are possible through the relentless geoengineering of photosynthetic bacteria, algae and plants. Uh, they are making the world more than we animals, uh, a place uh, worth living. Uh, and they created our oxygen that we use all the time. Well, much of the development uh, was luck uh, and accidental uh, inventions uh, with really profound effects. Uh, and, and what we see is that uh, we use uh, the, uh, uh, the inventions of the past as stable building blocks. Uh, so whatever was invented, some of the things uh, they simply did not go away and we used them as, as building blocks. And we gradually added more and more agency uh, as control over the in and output uh, and efficiency. Yeah, so uh, uh, bacterial cells, uh, they, they are pretty decently efficient, they can exist for a long time, uh, but eukaryotic cell Cells. They are so much more efficient in what they do and therefore uh, they have a place as well. Uh, but they are also, because they are more uh, complex, they are uh, maybe also more vulnerable and they pose higher uh, requirements on their environment uh, and therefore they should maintain their environment even better and when they don't, they die. So if I said, I would say something about wisdom. And so what about it? Well. Until now, we said a few things about wisdom. Uh, wisdom is a continual improvement without specific goal states. Uh, uh, it is about problem prevention. It is optimizing everything in the context of everything else and it is promoting self-actualization. These are typical things that I've said in the previous lectures about wisdom. But um, someone else uh, had a theory of wisdom, that is uh, Sternberg, the balanced theory of wisdom in which he has a fairly long complicated uh, definition of wisdom. Well, wisdom is the application of tested knowledge towards the application of a common good through a balance among intra, inter and extra personal interests to achieve a balance among adaptation to existing environments, shaping of existing environments and a selection of new environments over the long term as well as the short term. This is really complicated. So let's, uh, let's try to simplify and generalize it at the same time. So what, what is he really saying? Well, it is about balancing and it is about the application of tested knowledge. And tested knowledge is, is actually a skill. So it's about a balancing skill, what, what Sternberg is, uh, is saying. And it is uh, a common good. So a common good means for all of life, if you really generalize this. Uh, and intra, inter and extra personal interest, if you generalize them towards agents, then you have all agentic interests. And if you aim it at the adaptation to existing environments, shaping of existing environments, selection of new environments, we, ha we are talking about all habitats. And over the long term as well as the short term, we are basically talking about all, term, all times. So what we are talking is, something that contains all of life, all agentic interest, all habitats, all times, which is the biosphere from the very beginning until now, which is all of life, all of the biosphere until now. So what is wisdom? If you generalize it like this, it is the balancing skill to contribute to the biosphere. And that is interesting. So another uh, conception of wisdom uh, we had as well, uh, but I was not calling it wisdom, and it was this one. I talked uh, about the skill to protect, maintain, and extend the conditions on which existence depends in this particular thing. And that is also a very nice definition of wisdom. And if you compare it with the previous definition of wisdom, that was just a descriptive one. This is much more saying what, what you should actually do. Uh, protecting, maintaining and extending the conditions on which you and your existence depends. So then the conclusion or the, the open question or rhetorical question is, uh, is wisdom then the driver of all life on earth? And I think it is. Uh, but 
if wisdom is a skill, like Sternberg says, uh, then what would be the sum total of the application of that skill? What would be the sum total of all agent activities since the origin of life? And that, of course, would be the biosphere. Yeah, so the biosphere then is the end result of wisdom, uh, defined like this. And that leads to, to the last concept of today uh, that is uh, called stigmachy. Stigmachy is building on traces left in the environment. Uh, and that is what life did. Yeah, so uh, life did stuff, uh, changed the world and learned to live with the consequences and actually build on that. Uh, and it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And we have two forms of stigmachy. Uh, one is targeted optimization, create an environment for one specific purpose, or pervasive optimization, create an environment in which everything can flourish eventually. And uh, quite different ways, but both have their use. Uh, and, and although this is a negative uh, human picture, uh, the targeted optimization is definitely happening in every cell. Uh, uh, and all the, the photosynthetic cells have had targeted optimization and, uh, and their relentless uh, release of oxygen is what makes life uh, and animal life possible. So what now? Um, well, a few conclusions uh, that, that, that uh, can be drawn from this story. One is that you can only predict the short term and only locally and the long-term and global developments can only be adapted to. Uh, and the resilience to adapt is a key part, a key feature of life. That's a really important uh, concept. Uh, and uh, adaptation is uh, kind of the opposite of asserting, uh, and it's a different use of your intelligence. Well, you always have to work with the basis that you have, but you can add to the basis. But you can never destroy the foundations of your own existence. Life as a whole maintains, protects and extends the biosphere. And no individual species can keep the biosphere thriving. For the simple reason, you need all the different uh, aspects of the world. Uh, and you need to, be, to balance that, whatever is necessary, then you should keep up and take over, and etc. It is impossible to find one species that can, can do it all, at least not uh, keep it in a thriving situation. Well, innovations, uh, they were as inevitable. Uh, we, we found them uh, because there were opportunities as they are dangerous. And the short-term effects can be disastrous. Uh, so we had cyanobacteria that killed pretty much everything that didn't like uh, oxygen. We had trees that almost killed all life in the sea. And now we have humans that also play their part. Another thing is that a biosphere, although it developed, it has no leader, it has no central points. It is the sum total of all previous life's activities, and it is the only process that we know that can do this. Yeah, so a leader, it's actually pretty, pretty rare in uh, evolution. Last wisdom. Uh, wisdom then uh, is the skill to co-create hab habitable order uh, the whole biosphere uh, by protecting maintaining and existing and extending the conditions on which existence depends so let's go to um, the summary of today uh, what was the example it was the growth of the biosphere sustainability uh, we uh, we saw that is this little picture uh, so we have an agent uh, that should uh, tend to its own needs in the service of uh, the whole uh, the whole of its habitat. Um, in terms of development, we learned that uh, learning to live or with or building building on the consequences of your past actions is actually super important, and that is what drives uh, the whole of the biosphere and also uh, the development of of uh, living uh, animals, etc. Wisdom, we have a kind of a new uh, definition of wisdom or uh, um, uh, uh, that is protecting, maintaining and extending the conditions on which existence depends. Feelings, why is that here? Well, we talked about action readiness uh, and in a precarious environment you're ready to fight, in a rich environment you, are, you can learn, in a safe environment you, you can care, in a deficient environment you need to protect. 
Well, that is being ready in response to how you perceive the environment. And action readiness, it is used as a definition of emotion by Nico Freida. Then we had uh, appraisal of the environment, which is kind of the counterpart of action readiness. And uh, it says something, how we appraise the environment as precarious, rich, efficient, or safe. In systems, uh, we learned uh, that agency and membranes and control over in and output are even more important than you thought. Uh, and, uh, so this is what makes life, uh, or the membranes, uh, is, is where the really uh, smart things in, in, in life are happening. The concepts, well, we learned something about the biosphere, about wisdom again, appraisal, action readiness and stigmatry. So finally, uh, the references. Um, Wikipedia is actually excellent in terms of the evolution of the Earth and most of the information uh, that I presented here is also part of Wikipedia, uh, but uh, I also used uh, quite a bit of other articles. Then uh, I hope to see you at the next session on open-ended development.